Hello, everyone. So I am super delighted to be here, joined here by Joe Martino. And Joe is a somatic and breathwork coach, also a bit of a comedian, which we may or may not get into today, but most know him as a longtime journalist. Joe founded Collective Evolution, or CE, in 2009. CE grew to become ranked one of the top 1,000 websites in the entire world with more than 15 million views a month. And that was more than news sites like CNN, the BBC, and Vice. In 2014, Joe gave a TEDx talk about CE and examples that show change starts within. Starting October 2018, social media sites, especially Facebook and Twitter, but also YouTube, Apple and others, started deleting hundreds, then thousands of people who challenged the status quo. Uh, sites like the, Th the Free Thought Project, Police the Police and many more. And this became known as the purge. Fact checkers also started attacking alternative news sites and this caused CE and essentially Joe's multi-million dollar business at that point to falter. In 2019, CE launched a membership platform which provides interviews, courses, live events and discussions to explore our world in a different light and shift consciousness. In 2021, CE moved its current events journalism to a new brand called The Pulse. Almost finished, Joe's been very busy. The Pulse and Joe Martino's own personal publication, The Collective Evolution, can be found on Substack and we'll be sharing the links to all Joe's work at the end of this discussion and in the description of this interview, wherever you're watching or listening to it now. Joe states on The Collective Evolution, his Substack, I have a unique perspective to connect individual healing with greater societal change. I'm inspired by helping people heal and live their authentic full potential, then turning that into a collective evolution. So, Joe, I hope I managed to sum up your work successfully <laughs> since 2009. And thanks for joining us for this live audience interview today. Yeah, I mean, that was definitely a great, a great summary there of all the different little pieces to the puzzle over the years. And uh, thank you for the kind words mixed within there as well. Well, as we'll probably go into a little bit, you know, you your work has been massively influential and a massive part of my journey as well. Um, but I'd love to start with the question that I ask absolutely that I ask everybody when we do these interviews is kind of when was your awakening? And what I what I mean by awakening is like when did you realize that the world out there is not the way that we thought it was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, a kind of a tricky question to answer because I think mainly for for a lot of people it might be like moments that that sort of come here and there and they build up um for some people it's like just this smack dab like i watched a documentary and it just i went down the rabbit hole right and for me i kind of had the experience of when i was young i i kind of would always ask my parents like watching the news i would sit on the couch with them and it would be like um but but why is it like that you know but why why do we have hungry people on that side of the world when we have this going on um when you would see uh so much uh, like financial calamity for example i'd be like yeah but didn't we didn't we create the systems as 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 people can't we just like unchange them and, and make them better and make them work for people and these sorts of questions i think you know when i was younger was hinting at this idea that for some reason I was asking a lot of questions about the, the state of the world and the nature of how things were. And so I think that was kind of a primer for what kind of happened to me as I got older and started to get more into the world. Um, and on top of that, I, you know, and this kind of mixes in with what we've done with CE, but I've always had an interest in like the paranormal, supernatural, things that are unseen, right? So things that um, you can sense and feel, but aren't necessarily material. And I think that's important because um, there's so much in terms of spiritual curiosity and just general curiosity as beings that um, expand our consciousness to be able to hold bigger and greater ideas as, as we go forward. So in those early days as a, as a, as a kid, um, kind of seeing things in that way, I think by the time I got to around um, second year or around second year college, even though I was kind of in and out of college programs, kind of dropping them and starting new ones, um, I had actually seen uh, the film Zeitgeist as, and and that was all happening in like succession of like 
questioning things, questioning things, questioning things. And then, um, and then seeing the film zeitgeist and going, Hey, you know what, all these things that I've kind of been thinking, this is a really interesting sort of look at some of these things that are going on. Uh, primarily, uh, you know, in that film, it's, it's the religious institutions, it's nine 11. And, uh, um, I can't recall what the, what the other one is, but I think they start touching on some of the financial, uh, stuff. And, and so that kind of became a little bit of like a push to expand on a lot of the ways in which um, I, I was thinking about things and, and decide to take it a lot more seriously because at the time there wasn't a lot of people around me that you could have these conversations with and like really expand upon ideas. It was kind of like, you know, I don't know, that's a little bit weird or like, where are you even getting that from? You know, that kind of thing. So I would say that was probably kind of a, a moment that really gave me a push to continue going. And then the other big push was around 2009, I had met somebody who became a mentor for me, um, more in the space of, of transformational work. And uh, it was, you know, I was just going for sessions and, and we were talking things over about current events and about, you know, various forms of transformation. I was transforming myself. And, and from there, it, it kind of just sort of, I think, collided the two interests of you know, understanding, hey, why does the world function this way? And oh, it's functioning this way partly because of the way we are as human beings. And uh, and that kind of became like the push to start doing what I did in my career for the past, you know, 15 or so years. I've got a few questions there, but how did how did that then lead into kind of creating CE? I mean, was CE, you know, just you on a computer to start off or did you decide to sit down and start a business? How did that all kind of start out? Yeah, it's a good question. It, it technically started with, uh, we created a, a website prior called zeitgeistdebate.com. And it was, it was built off that interest of wanting to talk about these subjects but not really having many people to talk to. And uh, it was just a forum. Uh, so we would discuss not just about zeitgeist, but that was the way to kind of pull people's interest in because that movie was like super viral at the time. So we, we would, we would talk there and kind of do that. And it was just a friend of mine and I, and, and then one day I, I just started having this greater idea of, Hey, I want to bring a more coherent message to the picture, which is that transformational angle. And, um, it was, it was kind of like, I had this urge to just talk about what I was experiencing in my own sort of collision of transformation and current events. And what I felt was like a moment in society where it seemed as though some greater shift, some greater upheaval was occurring in succession that was causing people to go, Hey, what are we really doing here? And like, are, you know, should we maybe go back to the drawing board a little bit? So that wanting to talk about that birthed this idea of collective evolution, um, because it was, I remember sitting in a library, you know, talking to my friend going, well, you know, in terms of a name, I mean, what's really happening? We are, we're, we're evolving collectively. So, you know, collective evolution is an option. You know, we wrote that at the top of the paper and then, and then a whole bunch of other words and ideas. And, um, and then we kind of just left it. And then one day I'm like, wait, the first, the first name that came out there was, was perfect for a website, you know? And so I just created it set it up and started writing daily on it. Um, just blogs and like inspirational texts essentially to um, align with this idea of what was going on and what people were experiencing. And um, it was never necessarily like, Hey, let's start a business. It was just, let's talk about this stuff. Let's put it out there. And uh, over the course of time, as interest grew and there was a lot of people who resonated with the ideas, it became documentaries. And then from the documentaries, it became talking more about, about current events from a journalistic perspective. And then it just kept sort of building and building from there and eventually it turned into a business. And um, yeah, and then eventually it, you know, went through the stuff that you mentioned in the introduction there. Yeah. Through the faltering due to the mm -hmm. purge and the fact checkers. Um, I'm just wondering though, in those early days of CE, because CE became uh, a kind of a database of not only kind of self-work, inner work, spiritual work, but also a lot of the rabbit hole stuff as well. So, you know, mm -hmm. there was stuff on the war on terror, on mainstream media and many other topics as well. What was the initial um, vision for CE and did it stay the same or did it kind of change and develop over time? Yeah, I would say that um, the underlying philosophy 
which was to present this idea that for us to create a better reality, if you will, and by better, I mean, you know, a, a reality where humans can thrive and we're not creating so many problems for ourselves um, as we are with, with the systems that we have um, in a way, how can we experience pain? Cause that's going to be part of life, but without so much suffering, meaning the extended stuff. Right. Um, so that philosophy, uh, which, which bird, this idea of change starts within has really always been there. And what has changed, what has been refined, what has adjusted over time is the best ways to present this idea to our existing moment. Um, so back in, in 2009, when there wasn't a lot of, you know, like alternative news websites, there wasn't a lot of, um, let's just say there wasn't an abundance of even transformational content on the internet. You had some major authors that mainly wrote books, but there wasn't like this bevy of stuff all over social media. And so at the time that was our focus and just kind of talk about this collective evolution that we felt was happening, the shift in conscious transformation. But then once we realized that um, it kind of was hitting a bit of a, a peak because it, there, people weren't fully resonating with the idea that there was a need for a change. That's when we we pulled back and said, okay, let's look at current events here. Current events is what a lot of people focus their time and energy and their attention on. What if there was a way to look at current events and pull out an understanding of uh, or ask questions like, why is this functioning like this though? Um, if if this is the symptom of our existing system, you know what is really causing the symptom, right? And then, so how do you get to the core to be able to then discuss, you know, how we can change that core versus just addressing symptoms all day long, only to create more symptoms down the line, right? Because it's kind of the way we've been, um, leadership has been running societies in our world for a while is it's just been, you know, a symptom pops up. Okay, let's address that symptom, but we're never really talking about the core. So this idea of change starts within moved into the exploration of current events to then, address the question, do we need to change within in order to change the systems around us? And, uh, and that was, so that was one way it evolved. Um, another way it evolved over the years was just getting, getting stronger and stronger and clearer and clearer with the level of journalism, the level of evidence, the level of proof that's required to, um, present specific ideas. Um, the, the, the way language can be used to really resonate with, kind of the moment, right? Like we seem to go through these periods where, hey, it's for these four years, these types of framings and and words really make sense. But then in these four years, it's really better to frame it this way. And then, you know, and so we've kind of, we've always met in our perspective where the collective, how we could best serve the collective, right? Um, and that's kind of how things have adjusted over the years. Yeah, I know that you're, you're really massive and kind of passionate on critical thinking mm -hmm. and what what it feels to me like when you're describing that is rather than kind of telling people this is happening or this is or this needs to happen presenting the information in a way that people then come to that conclusion themselves by just peeling away those onion layers and finding out what's kind of at the core um I don't know if this is an easy one to kind of summarize, but what is critical thinking for you? How would you define that? You know, because mm -hmm. I teach critical thinking at university. We've talked about that before, but what, what is critical thinking for you? Yeah, for me, it's a full body process. It's an, it's, it's a full, um, let's say, uh, human experience process. What I mean by that is I think uh, that critical thinking is is cognitive. It's it's about how you feel in your body, but it's also about maintaining that spirit, that spirit of openness, that spirit of questioning, that it, it, that spirit of uh, what can I sense? What do I feel in my gut? And it's not to say that my gut is absolutely correct, but it's that if we're if we're totally cognitive, we can miss out on all of these other sensory elements that that give us information that the brain can then sort of process, right? Um, so for me, critical thinking is that that total experience. To get more specific with that, I would say um, what we try and teach is if we can first be embodied, which is to say, how do I regulate my nervous system? How do I feel within my body, within I can feel my butt in the chair, I can maintain my presence as I engage with a piece of news, uh, something that I'm watching in terms of a video, and then as I'm taking in the information, I'm also paying attention. Well, does this make sense? 
Um, okay, sure. Does it give me a feeling? Well, hey, I had an emotion come up. I had a trigger come up there. Okay, does that mean that the information's wrong, or is it something that I'm getting triggered by something because it's challenging something within me, right? So it's it's being present with that process and going through it because critical thinking is about asking many questions in a story of complexity ultimately at the end of the day very few things in life are are just black and white so in order to critically think it's just being able to ask those questions and explore from different angles um but some of that is a personal process of i may want to not ask certain questions or i may want to hastily jump to conclusions because of pre-existing ideas or beliefs and that's okay it's not to be like hey our biases or our beliefs are are wrong or they're bad but it's more so to say if I adopt this spirit of exploration, this idea that I'm trying to explore to find the answer, you notice that there's adventure there, there's fun there, there's curiosity there. And all of those elements are, are key in a, a well body, a body that's functioning from a standpoint of, of being relaxed, being socially connected. When we're in survival, we want to be more defensive. We want to be more aggressive, right? Survival and stress kind of go hand in hand. So if we're if we're kind of stressed out and we're we're watching the news, that process of critical thinking is hindered because what begins to happen is, is we want to jump to a conclusion because stress is kind of running our physiology. We may want to avoid certain things because we're in a position of, of defensiveness and, and we don't want to have something challenged. So that's what I mean by this sort of full body process, um, being able to kind of be with the experience, using each other, using communication with other people to sort of challenge our ideas, explore our ideas, expand on our ideas, go a little bit deeper. Um, so critical thinking to me is kind of all those things um, mixed in together. So does that mean for you also that critical thinking can be a kind of a healing process in and of itself as well? Because you're talking about, you know, to, in order to, 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 to think critically, we need to regulate the nervous system. We need to make sure that we're coming at it from a from a grounded balanced state um and of course many people aren't doing that or need to work on that at the same time yeah absolutely yeah and 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 you know that's that's the piece to the puzzle right is when you have the foundation of the physiology there you can then build upon that through learning how to critically think learning how to ask different questions learning how to explore biases where they come from how you can develop biases from your experience and so on and so forth um so it's kind of a it's kind of a yeah like a process that begins with that foundation um and expands outwards in sort of mastering the art of critical thinking which then becomes you know more specific as you go down so just just out of curiosity then because I kind of see the, the the phases of waking up, if you like. First of all, the cognitive dissonance. You've got to go through that that stage of what I've been told is not true, and accept that. You've got to accept that that this world is different to, and you know the structures are not the same as I thought they were. And then generally, it seems like people and I did this. You then go when you go down those rabbit holes, you go into a place of doom and gloom. And it feels like, you know, we're all screwed. There's nothing we can do. How can we possibly do something about this? And then you kind of move into a stage of reclaiming health, focusing on, well, what can we do? Focusing on solutions. How can I contribute? So I'm just wondering, when, when you were going through all those rabbit holes, when you were writing all that content and finding out how everything's connected, did you go into a doom and gloom state or were you able to kind of go through that while regulating the nervous system and keeping yourself in a balanced state? Yeah. So that's a good question because um, my position is that the doom and gloom process isn't hundred percent necessary, although, you know, it can be natural to someone's experience, which is great. Um, I have ideas as to kind of where that doom and gloom comes from and why it can be so prominent. But before I get to that, I personally didn't go through a doom and gloom period. And I, I wouldn't have said that back in the day in 2009, 10, 11, as I was kind of learning a lot of things that I was regulating my nervous system because I didn't know that sort of verbiage and language back then. Um, that's more in the training I've done in the last three and a half years or so. But was I doing things that when I look back, it relates to that regulation and staying grounded? Absolutely. Um, a lot of it though, was holding this perspective that 
we were going through a transition or we were going through a change as we go through that the the chaos around us or the difficult things around us act as an evolutionary pressure right so for me my position on the the doom and gloom was more so the difficulty here some of the conflict is actually a part of the process and it can be helpful now the key here is is to not avoid emotions that might arise it, working with that, processing that, honoring that, and noticing that feeling that maybe it's disparity for a moment, maybe it's hopelessness, maybe it's these different feelings, and working with that is very, very important. However, I think that part of the reason why there is so much doom and gloom and why people get stuck in those ruts is because the nature of a lot of the content that's out there can put people into that with a very little redeeming qualities in terms of how to work with that or what to do about that. So one of the ways in which we we always tried to approach our content differently was to acknowledge that for some people they would experience or feel different things. Um, how could we offer something in terms of how to sit with that and how to work with that? So for example, if something happens in current events that makes us angry, um, it's probably rightfully so that something makes us angry if it's very unjust, right? Now, the question is, is do we want to harbor in that anger for a long period of time, or do we want to take the note of that anger, which is to say, okay, it gave me feedback that something in my experience is not necessarily um, in alignment with what I want to create. Well, I can't, if I, if I stick with that, not only am I going to burn myself out with that anger, but over the course of time, I'm going to dysregulate, and then everything's going to start to go downhill from there. Because, because essentially, anger that that let's say isn't processed correctly becomes toxic, right? So you have the anger, you process it, you move it through, you express it in a healthy and non-destructive manner, and then and then you got to move on from there. However, a lot of I find a lot of the content out there, what happens is is um, it's almost like inviting more and more anger, more and more frustration, more and more this, and then people become more and more entrenched in it and then it becomes addictive right and we, we we can kind of go on all day as to like where the many pathways that can lead but the idea is i i think that the doom and gloom can be skipped for some people um but healthily skipped meaning it's not avoided as like the doom and gloom is bad but it's, so it's not avoided it could also be very temporary so it's like oh man i feel this is such a big thing to undertake to to feel to notice and we can move through that and come out the other side uh, pretty quickly in in a positive way. Um, but if we're getting stuck there, I feel like there's there's work that can be done. And my hope, and this is why we've chosen to take the approach that we did, is to really help make that doom and gloom process just as short as it absolutely needs to be, um, meaning to not avoid it again, but to 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 really help people through it. Um, for whatever it needs to be for their experience, but but process it in a healthy manner. Expanding on what you've just said, um, how, how would you connect the inner work, if we want to call it inner work or spiritual journey or self-development to actual societal change out there? So um, there's kind of two elements to this in my perspective. There's like the material element and the non-material element. So on the non-material side, you can get into sort of the quantum understanding of our world that is still developing, but, you know, morphic fields, uh, the way in which that something over here can affect something over here and so on and so forth. Let's just put a pin in that for a moment. On the material side, you have this, um, I'm if I'm in a good place, something as simple as I feel good, solid, grounded within myself, and I go out into my community, more than likely, I'm going to be kinder to the community around me, right? Um, that is a very, very small way in which that happens. The more stressed out people are, as we saw through COVID, stressed out in fear and panic, people were suddenly not as kind to each other. There was all of this, you know, you had, we started seeing signs go up at virtually all the stores. When you come in here, please be kind. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it was like, you know, just please don't don't insult the employees, don't do this, don't do that. And that was an interesting uh, moment to see how intense a stressful moment can be on the way a, a community interacts, right? So this is a very small way. But now let's take that transformation a little deeper and I start expanding on, wait, why exactly is the world the way it is? Like if I don't like Justin Trudeau, and and I just put a flag that says F Trudeau, which is the type of flags that you see all around uh, at certain events. You know, you think to yourself, okay, that I understand how you're feeling, you know, but 
but how did Trudeau come to be, right? And then, and then what society is supporting Trudeau? And then, and then what about us is even engaging in these systems the way we are? And it's just kind of, you know what I'm saying? So you keep going back and you start realizing like, there's, this kind of gets into a deeper discussion of like in-system, out-system, long-term, short-term solutions. But the point is, is it's like, there's something deeper within our society and our collective consciousness that is often upholding the way our society is today. And as we expand and ask better questions and get closer to different experiences, or sorry, different understandings of what's going on, we begin to take different action. And as we take different action, it could be something as simple as, well, I realize that in the long term, the system has to change. So I might work with a group of people to create, because I now see and feel differently, and I'm not just angry fighting in this dual dynamic with the system, battling, battling, battling. I, I, I ended the battle. I see that there's an element of raising awareness about the existing system that's necessary, but I can go create some parallel solutions or some local solutions with other community members that understand what's going on. So that inner transformation, that inner expansion of consciousness as to what's really going on, then creates a new set of actions. And, and then you move into those new set of actions. And the more that you have on board this, this humbleness and willingness to move through things like conflict resolution, when you do have disagreements in your new communities that you're forming, which is transformation-based, you then have the ability to keep those communities together, allow them to thrive, allow them to move forward, right? Because there's always going to be conflict to some extent, but how are we showing up to that conflict? Are we taking the traumas from the old world, which felt very you know, uh, authoritarian and pushing down? Are we bringing those into you know, the new communities that we're trying to create or are we like allowing those to be processed and, and move through so that the communities we do create are thriving, right? So, so that's kind of on the material side, how that can create change there. Of course, the thing I, I, I'll briefly mention is there can be short-term in-system solutions that are also necessary. So now that I have a different perspective on things, I'm not set on our existing system for my whole life. So I, I kind of look at it and say, in the short term, in the next one or two years, how can I participate in the existing system in a way that is useful, that in a way that may put, uh, you know, some healthy pressure on a local politician or something like that. And I have that option, but again, I'm not fighting it. I'm, I'm putting the pressure in a way that allows me to still do something because certain in-system solutions still wake people up to the nature of what's going on there. So, so there's a little complexity as to how that can happen and, and the ways in which some people are avoid the system entirely or, you know, be in the system fully. And I kind of say that it's a, it's a mix, right? So that's the material side on the non-material side. Uh, no, not much to expand on entirely other than kind of getting into the discussion of, uh, I think as consciousness shift as, as pockets of people begin operating differently, I do think there's a morphic resonance. I think there's, uh, there's something that is felt. Um, we all know that we've walked into a room where you could feel the tension or you could feel the love or you could feel the sadness or you could feel the fear or whatever it might be. Um, and I think those things are not seen, um, but they are a, a big part of our experience and a big part of our life. And if we are transformational and focused and we're grounded and we're well, and we walk into an environment, I think people can feel that. And sometimes they can't put their finger on it, but it sort of maybe asks them like, hey, why do I always feel good when I'm around that person, right? So that can have an effect. But then I also believe that expands to a greater collective effect, meaning the more that you can uplift the spirit of humanity in general, I do think it has somewhat of a spillover effect on others that are, um, that, that, that sort of experience it in a, uh, it's in the air type way. Yeah, I actually came across a study by, doc, I think, Dr. Robert Lanza um, from Collective Evolution, you know, on a, in an article from Collective Evolution, and, and you were referring to an article from Big Think, which was saying that, you know, our the world out there is a represent, representation of what is collectively, our collective worldview. Mm -hmm. um, and that was touching on quantum physics, quantum mechanics. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious because... Your TED talk was in 2014 and you were talking in that TED talk about how there's a shift in consciousness, mm -hmm. connecting that to 2018. And when uh, you had the fact checkers and you had the problem with, with, with um, viewership and you were getting millions of views. And we, we've talked about this a little bit, you know, not in this interview is 
where you, you know where did those millions go are they still around you know when when the last three years came up are, were those were those millions still awake and aware or uh, did they disappear and do you still believe that there is a shift in consciousness taking place moving forward and while you answer that question i'm just going to quickly shut this window <laughs> yeah so i i think uh on the on the topic of like where did the millions go so i mean the it's a it's an interesting question to answer because the way so much of the internet worked over the years was um you know people found content that they liked and engaged with content that they liked um typically somewhat casually um meaning if i followed five fa facebook pages i would see their content and i would appreciate it and i'd like it but am i the behavior that was created during that period was you know, I have this phone and social media is essentially just going to provide me all the things that I need pretty much at all times. Right. And, and that behavior was there. And so when you're getting 15, 20 million, you know, viewers through a month, um, you know, for, for, it, it, you know, it was kind of like a slow process, right? It was like 15, 20 million. Then it was like 10 as reach continued to decline. Then it was 10, right. Then it was like eight and five. And it, and it happened over a number of years where, you know, we're at probably about one and a half to 2 million at the moment monthly, but it's that type thing where it's like, if, if the habits and the patterns of people don't shift along with the shifts that are happening in the way that they're getting their content, then yes, it's like they sort of just disappear into other forms of content that they're finding at whatever period or, or, or not. Um, you know, we always kind of maintained certain chunks of people on our email list or on telegram or all these different little pieces of the puzzle. But, but yeah, it was, I do, I think those people kind of just disappeared. Um, I think, you know, people kind of went in different paths. Maybe they engaged with different bits of content and, you know, different things happen with new brands. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that for the most part, um, I don't think they suddenly like went to sleep per se, you know, in, in that kind of sense. Um, I think the other piece to this is the uh, discussion of um, uh, you were asking about, sorry, what was the other, the, the first part of it? So there was a, where did the audience myself. go? Oh, yeah, the, believe... the TED talk. Yeah. And you were talking back in 2014 that there was a shift in consciousness yes. taking place and whether you still feel that that's, that's continuing. Yeah, yeah so I, I do. I, I, I believe that it is taking place. I, I think my perspective on sort of how it looks has, has shifted slightly. Um, but for the most part, I do believe that something is occurring. Um, I've, I've done a recent podcast on this subject, like literally answering this question to sort of frame it in ways that I see a lot of other people are framing it, which is this acknowledgement of some semblance of a meaning crisis. And this meaning crisis is, is having us look at not only the nature of the way we're living our lives and why there seems to be a, a felt sense that the, the, there's a loss of meaning, there's a loss of purpose, there's a loss of something there. We used to talk about this a lot in the framing of a shift in consciousness, which was to say like, hey, we're, what are, why are we even doing what we're doing? Like, what is the point? Like, where did we learn this? Where did we, you know, and, and, and you kind of just ask that question philosophically, um, which can be something you have to do a little bit carefully because um, to go through life with a lack of meaning and purpose can be a heavy thing to carry. Um, but I do think that it is it is occurring um, from the standpoint of, I believe that we've come to the end of major systems that are operating on our planet, which creates a, uh, let's say, a spike in how fast things are going to change. Um, because there's so much more chaos occurring all at once, whether it be the, uh, you know, for example, a lot of people are, are kind of acknowledging that capitalism, right? Just this, this project that we've had is kind of reaching a point where even people in the mainstream are looking at it and going, yeah, there's something wrong here. Maybe we can't put our finger on it. Maybe we don't know exactly how the new system should look, but this is destroying everything. It's not sustainable. There's something wrong. And, um, I think that resembles a, a shift in consciousness driven by the, you know, the experiences that we're having, but perhaps even driven by something greater, which is, is there a bit more of a galactic type evolution occurring? Is there something changing in the way our sun um, is emitting cosmic rays, for example, on the planet? And, you know, there's been some interesting studies from, from the past that, that cosmic rays do have an impact on human consciousness, right? So there's, there's all these different pieces to the puzzle um, that, play into how a 
shift in consciousness occurs, but I do think something is, is occurring. I mean, I agree with you, but if you were getting uh, how many million views was it at some point, 15 million views a month, mm -hmm. more than other mainstream news channels. And it just, on a personal note, I managed to convince my mum that 9-11 wasn't the same as the official narrative. And it took a while, but finally I got there and she was like, oh, wow, yeah, no, this really doesn't seem to fit. And then when the last three years came along, she just jumped right back in again. And mm -hmm. uh, so I was just thinking, you know, how can you, how can you see that is the way that it is and then fall for it all over again? But at the same time, you know, there are studies, there's surveys out there that, you know, kind of half the world right now is thinking that their freedoms are being taken away and things like mm -hmm. that. So, and I think part of what happens there is, um, you know, people, they, they question something, it might sort of, uh, uh, sort of simmer for a little while. And, um, but then when life becomes stressful or when life becomes difficult, um, or when, something is occurring like with COVID where there's a lot of fear because there's a lot of unknown, it might pull us back in because that's still a little bit more comfortable than the little bit unsolid ground of, of questioning things. And so I, I think sometimes there's a little bit of a, of a subconscious titration that occurs in the process of people's awakening um, where it's like, I know this is a little too much for me, so I'm, I'm only going to take a little bit. And, and I'm and I'm just going to allow it to sort of expand. I'm not saying that they're doing that consciously per se, but it's just kind of this intelligence that might work through the body. Um, I, I believe a lot in in sort of body consciousness and and our ability to kind of understand and notice to some extent, even subconsciously, what might feel like too much for us. And so I think that to a degree, some people are always kind of just taking that lighter route because we also don't have the capacities on board culturally to move through um, such worldview shifting moments, like in a way where we feel good about it, right? I mean, that's part of our, our company's mission is to try and examine, hey, if we're going to have to question the nature of our systems, if we're going to have to to understand truths that may feel difficult how do we build the capacity of human beings to hold those possibilities and to move through them in a way that feels more comfortable and more stable? Because I mean, being in this community for 15 years, I've seen a lot of people go down the conspiracy rabbit hole in a very unhealthy manner and become, you know, uh, let's say very, very unstable, even being, uh, you know, sort of hospitalized in a, like a men mental hospital um, because it, it cracks your worldview so much and sometimes like, what are you supposed to do with that? Right. And, and if there's instability there and there's not a lot of support and there's not a lot of like, how do I work with this? It can end in, in some difficult moments. Right. So I think there's somewhat of a, of a kind of a knowing or an intelligence within some people to, to take it a little bit more slowly. Do I think it's a sign of a slowing shift? No, I just think that sometimes the things aren't going to look exactly as we think they might look when somebody like, it's not necessarily like a straight line progression or even like a curved progression. But I think sometimes it, it kind of goes like this. Um, and um, the, the other sort of piece to this is just that I think in general, as a whole, I think more people are, are noticing what is going on around the world. They're, they're questioning and yes, maybe it's not happening at a rate that, for example, I used to think back in the day, I thought things would change a little quicker, but I, I do still think it's happening. Like even something as simple as the, the, the mainstream media, like the way people perceive mainstream media now is radically different than the way they perceived it even five years ago. And when when Tucker Carlson, for example, is leaving Fox, and, and it's not about whether someone's a fan of Tucker or not, it's more so when he's leaving Fox, uh, and the, the, the most, you know, the biggest performer of mainstream media essentially is leaving to go do something independently. And when you watch, I remember about three or four months ago, I said to a couple of friends of mine, I said, Tucker's popping up on random podcasts. He's, he's on a uh, small, like, you know, Hey, this, these people have a hundred thousand audience. These people have 500, these people have 50,000, whatever. Why is he popping up on these podcasts? 
And uh, I said to them, I think, I think he's getting ready to leave Fox and he's probably going to go independent. And he's probably also going to say things that he can't really say on the network. And sure enough, I mean, as of a few weeks ago, he left and now there's all this speculation as to why and this, and was it because of the lawsuit and blah, blah, blah. But the point is, is that something was in the works. And I think that shift in the way mainstream media is losing its power over people, it's losing, people are questioning it in such a, a big way. That to me alone is a shift in consciousness that is going to create a moment of much quicker unfoldment because mainstream media was primarily the way in which most people's perceptions were built. So if there's significantly less attention there, um, now perceptions are built in, in another way. Now it might be chaotic for a little bit, which is why, again, we like to focus on the critical thinking and the this and the that, because you don't want to just leave mainstream media and believe everything you hear in the alternative, right? But, but you know, I think there's something there that that is bigger than maybe sometimes we give we give credit to. Everything you say, I'm like, oh yeah, loads of questions, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move on slightly to something else. I'm just wondering that. So, when the fact checkers started attacking uh, the articles from CE. And you could see how this was affecting the business. For me, I, you know, I was a, a, a contributing writer from 2014. And then I just saw, you know, the whole, you started to take everything away or the content disappeared. And for me, that was like, that was really you know, sad, you know, it's kind of devastating to see that happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, how was that process for you? How was it? you know, kind of emotionally, what was it like going through that process of, of, of watching this thing that you'd built suddenly start to kind of peel away? Yeah. Yeah. I would say at, at first it was, a lot of it was you have a business you're responsible for, well, in, in your mind as the business owner, you're responsible for paying the people that you have employed. We had about 14 people employed and, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're paying them. And if you're, not going to be able to pay them. I took the philosophy that I, I want them to know kind of what's going on so that they're prepared and they can make life decisions. And it's not just like a shock. Hey, you come to work one day and you know, there's no job. Right. So I kind of took that position of treating it a little bit like a family. Um, so for the first while it was just adjusting to and navigating how fast things were changing and then trying to work with, okay, what are our resources? Like, what can we do about them? How can we pivot? How can we do this? How should we, you know, notify employees? How do we how do we move through this process? And so initially it was a high stress sort of always pivoting, always trying to adjust, always trying to figure out sort of what to do uh, inside the business. And that is actually what led me at the end of the day to burnout because um, I was basically just operating under stress all the time because everything was being stripped away. And no matter which way we pivoted, it just was never quite enough and it was never quite working and it was never quite grabbing hold. And, you know, to some extent, while you're going through that, it's hard to fully find that piece and asking the question, like, is this part of some greater thing that's going on? Like, is this the path that I'm supposed to be? You know what I'm saying? You're, you're not really favoring that type of, of reflection easily because there's, it's like, you feel like there's a mountain. Um, and so, so that was the first while the first while was, feeling frustrated and feeling stressed out, trying to just pivot to make things work. Um, by the time we got to about 2019 and we had trimmed things down, uh, things felt a little bit more stable. And then, then there was a period of sort of like, yeah, this like anger and frustration of like, I can't believe, you know, you put like 10, 11 years into something and then someone can just you know, snap a finger and like, it's like, it's, it's just, it's gone. Um, and it was, it was a difficult sort of feeling to go through. And then there was the moment probably around 2020 where we had to make a tough decision, which was to say, we have this existing body of content on collective evolution and we have all of it's been posted on Facebook. And one of the things that that some people don't uh, know about the, the story of fact checking is fact checkers could really go through and go on Facebook all the way back to something that happened in 2015, 2014, and just throw a fact check on it. 
And so what they started to do is they would do things like we wrote about in 2014 about a study that came out about milk suggesting, okay, hey, you know, maybe milk isn't that great for the bones. And, you know, in this study, it led to this, that, whatever. And they would throw a fact check on it and say, well, a study from 2017 said that it was actually okay for bones. So it's like, well, okay, so you're going back in time. And like, why aren't you doing that to science? Why aren't you retracting in every scientific journal a study that says something different from a study that came out in 27? You know what I'm saying? Like, it just became nonsense the way fact checkers were operating. It was clearly sort of um, a tart because we started writing about them. We started writing about what fact checkers were doing. We weren't calling them names or, you know, doing anything. We were just saying, hey, fact checkers are doing X and here's the company, here's who owns the companies, you know, this is what's going on. And um, and I think it became a little bit of like, now they were trying to find any, any way that they could throw four, five, six fact checks on us all in a row, because those fact checks were, once you get to five or six on Facebook, your reach goes to the minimum that it could possibly be. You remove some of those, it goes up a little bit more. You remove them all, it goes up a little more sustained fact checks permanently puts your reach low. So there's 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 a, a technical underpinning for how Facebook limitation and traffic works. And I think these fact checkers might have been just trying to make that happen. And um, so that became a question of, okay, now should we just remove all of the content that's on CE from back in the day? Because we have 10,000 plus articles. There's no way we can go through them all and guess as to what the fact checkers are going to hit us for, we can't afford to keep getting fact checks because it's going to eventually just remove our page entirely. So it was this moment of, we don't know what to do. And we chose to basically legacy the old website, which was to, to take it offline, but we still have all the content. Um, and that was the choice we made. And at first it, it, I didn't feel it. I didn't feel like what really that meant. But, but yeah, what it meant was, and I was telling a, a friend of mine actually recently was it felt like a very similar all out rejection that I experienced in like grade five or six or something like that, where my peers were starting to reject me for my ideas. And back then I was saying, Hey guys, I don't know. I feel, I have this weird feeling about some of the stuff we're learning at school here. It feels more like we're sort of being brainwashed into learning how to be in the system or well, live life, I would probably call it back in the day, we're just kind of being brainwashed to like accept certain things as opposed to just like learning in school. Right. And, and I was like, Joe, that's weird. Like, why are you saying that? Right. And, and I, I started to get ostracized in at that point in my life. And then, so here I am feeling this now many, many years later in my, uh, what would have been, I guess, right around 30, um, and it was the same type of feeling, like this ultimate rejection of my ideas by society, saying this is not allowed, and uh, and it felt very real. It was it was my my income, it was my business, it was everything I spent the last you know 10, 12 years building. It was part of the way in which I I built my my identity to to some extent, right? Um, and so it was it was it 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 kind of hit me a little bit later what it felt like to kind of see that downfall and to have to get rid of my work and, and, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, I do feel at the moment that I've worked beyond most of that. However, you know, as if, if people who've done somatic work know, sometimes shit pops up that you think has been long gone. You know? So, so I, I never say never, but, but I did, I do feel I've gone through the process of kind of working through a lot of that. All right, we've got about 10 minutes to go. So the people in the audience, if you want to think about questions, we'll finish in about 10 minutes. Joe, I'm just wondering, so this last three years, you started The Pulse in 2021. Um, what was this? You know, I'm, I'm just saying the last three years because I want to post this on YouTube as well. Uh, yeah. what, what, what is, what, how, how has the last three years um kind of affected the process, your work, what you're doing, things like that? Um, so I would say the last, the last three years was creating the, creating the pulse was like creating a more mainstream ready. Um, you could say slightly more culturally palatable <laughs> uh, version of what we were doing. Um, with the same philosophy sort of built into it with an attempt to sort of fly under the radar in the eyes of the mainstream as to who we were. Right. Um, and so you can, you can see with, with all of that, 
what I just said there, part of it is strategy, but part of it was like, there wasn't the same, let's say, really raw passion for creating a brand that there was with Collective Evolution, which meant so much to me and, and just even the name of it. Um, and it's not to say that I don't care or love the pulse and, and think that it's good. And I, I do stand behind what we're creating there. It's just, it, it just didn't have quite that same feeling. So there was, there was working with that a little bit. And then on top of that, again, because our, our goal was to, how do we really meet people where, where we're at, especially in a time of COVID, right? COVID was just kind of, you know, starting to trickle up and, um, we're, we're, we're meeting people at this moment and we're trying to not, I guess, like fall into the, the spotlight of fact checkers at the same time. So it became this much more meticulous process of trying to like, okay, are we going to get fact checked for this? And that doesn't mean, are we putting out something that's factually correct? It means, are we providing enough context enough of what they want to hear, their language, this, that, what are we providing enough of that so as to not get fact checked? So the process became um, a, a little bit like almost too calculated at times because you're you're trying to respond to something that is just entirely unreasonable. And you haven't yet figured out if doing it that way is a good idea or a bad idea. And so you're kind of just experimenting. And um and so I would say that the process of the pulse has been a little less fun than CE, but also it drew in exactly kind of what we thought, which is um, uh, the people we had, plus a very academic audience at times, a very, you know, a lot of forward thinking, um, uh, let's say, like professors and this, that, whatever, which, which was the purpose of that was we wanted to take our existing audience and we wanted to bring in more of that mainstream. We wanted to bring in more of those people that were, were trying to, that, that, that kind of had the ability to impact society more so than, you know, all of us sort of average people that aren't like at the top of an academic college or something where you're noticing this, for example, when did people learn how bad censorship really was? when the doctors, the scientists, and the PhDs were getting censored. We were screaming at the top of our lungs for years that this was happening and nobody cared. But the moment the renowned doctors and scientists, and they, because those people have legitimacy amongst a society, right? They're, they're appreciative. If the New York Times started to get censored because it has existing legitimacy, there would be, okay, here, here that's a big deal, right? So, so our goal was to try and put this information it, more so into the hands of of people that had the ability to speak up and be taken seriously by, um, you know, by the, the greater society, right? Um, so that's kind of that's kind of part of of the way we design the pulse, and and I I think it has worked. Uh, um, we have I get emails all the time from different professors at universities and this that whatever, and they're like, yeah, I really enjoy this. Hey, can you come talk to our class? Can you do this? Can you do that? And I think that in a way was a good way to sort of, like I was saying at the beginning, serve a different part of the collective for a short period of time. Right, I want to squeeze in two last questions. So the first one is, what about now, post the last three years? What, what, what are you now focusing on? What do you want to do? What, what's your vision moving forward? Hmm. Yeah. So the last, uh, so the last three and a half years, I've been essentially along with the work I've been doing uh, on the public side, I've been doing a lot of training in somatic work. I already had had a lot of uh, training in breath work. And so I've kind of been, really just been putting them together. Um, it, it's helped to put verbiage and, and science and stuff to a lot of the ideas, the spiritual ideas, the, um, you know, the transformational, uh, I guess, ideas that I've had all this time, I now have like a really good container to, um, to discuss this. And so I, I've kind of just been building up a way to like, I'm going to focus probably about 60% of my attention on more of the transformational arts, um, moving forward pretty soon and, and like less time doing media work, because to be quite honest, there are as a result of, of, I think what so many of not just CE, but other brands in the alternative have, have done over the years, I think it paved a way for a, a, a whole bunch more people to join this uh, alternative media sphere and not feel as like afraid to like talk about things or whatever. And so I do believe that the 
alternative media sphere is, is large now. And maybe that's not where I have to spend for myself personally as much energy because there's so many other people in the collective that are taking care of that. Maybe I can go down this route and really build this this narrative stronger of collect of of connecting the transformational aspect to the current events and and sort of bridge that gap more purely focused. Um, and so that's kind of what my plan is is to to sort of slightly within the same spectrum of what I've been doing, slightly divert some of my attention and energy to working more um, on the transformational side and really just connecting to things like collective trauma and all these sorts of things and and making that accessible. Great. So then that fits in nicely with my last question, which is also you mentioned in the TED talk that when you were young, there was depression there. Um, Mm -hmm. I grew up with suicidal ideation. Um, I also around that like 9-11 time zeitgeist, I remember that was a big part of my waking up. So my question is like, what would you advise to people? I also may be bringing in a bit of the comedy and the importance of perhaps laughing and joy, but what Mm -hmm. what would be your advice to people who are struggling, who are feeling depressed, who are feeling um, that this is too much, that they can't cope? Um, What would your advice be to people that are struggling in these times? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of places there that uh, that I could go because I I do one thing I've learned in the somatic work is kind of like everybody is so different that it can be um, it can be hard to give an answer that that can really just apply to everybody. But really, a general rule is we, we I think we always gain something by by slowing down, by consuming less, by taking breaks if we need to take breaks from whether it be social media or whatever it might be. Um, slowing down is a way of, of signaling back to our, our, our system, our body, like, Hey, you can, you can relax, you can feel more calm. Um, you know, that sort of thing. However, sometimes slowing down can be, um, a challenging thing for people because you feel more of what you got going on there. Right. So, um, what I always often say is, is, is check out different things that are beginner, um, sort of places, if that's where you're at for, um, how to find more regulation in, in your body at a nervous system level. Um, so you can look that up. There's tons of content on YouTube. There's tons of articles out there. Um, I have a few pieces out on, on collective evolution that, um, that discuss this idea. And because that's to me, the foundation, the more you can feel safe and at home in your body, the more you're going to have capacity to be able to navigate all the other things outside of you. Um, however, you know, that takes time. So cutting back on external stimuli that are constantly, you know, making you feel stressed is a great way to almost immediately lower the way you're feeling, lower what's going on. Um, we are by nature, social beings and social media, I don't believe is the same type of social that we are on a physiological level. And so, um, there is a huge, huge benefit in making sure that you are seeing people that you enjoy spending time with you know, two, three times a week, especially if you're feeling down and, and looking at them and seeing them and, and noticing their facial expressions and being with their body. You know what I'm saying? That is, that has a massive healing effect, um, on, on ourselves. And it, it gives us a sense that there's support. It gives us a sense that we're not alone. And sometimes that is, is, is huge. Um, basic things like how can you slightly improve your diet? How can you add more water? If dehydration is an issue, how can you move? Even if it's a 15, 20 minute walk every day, you know, all of these things sort of together, but done in a titrated way, meaning take on what you can handle, take on what you honestly believe you can do for a week straight, right. Without feeling like this is too much. And, and just doing those things little by little, not feeling like you have to rush your, your healing, not feeling like it has to happen tomorrow, not feeling like you have to change everything in your life you know, immediately and make a list of things and then boom, new routine, but just little bits. Um, you'll notice three weeks later, you're like, man, I've, I've drank, you know, four, three liters of water every day. And I'm like, I do feel a little bit better. Great. Now, because I feel a little bit better, I have a little bit more capacity. So what else can I take on that's minor that can make me feel a little better? And then bingo, bango, and you keep building that capacity, you know, over time. Um, so it just depends. Like uh, that's trying, I'm trying to be a bit broad because I I coach, I coach people one-on-one for somatic stuff and, um, people are very different and what they need at that moment 
uh, can be very different, but I think what I offered is, is a decent little start. Yeah. And also the message of, you know, taking little steps and, you know, not kind of looking right over to the goal and then being disappointed because you're nowhere near that goal, but just mm -hmm. moving in little steps forward. All right, Joe. Um, thank you so much for this interview. There's so much. There's so much more that I would that I could have asked. That I'd love to. I mean, the your interest in the the, the paranormal. Um, I know from uh, articles that I've read about you that you've done breath work where you've had kind of experiences. I think you did a Wim Hof exercise once where you kind of left the body and stuff like that. So there's all that kind of stuff that would be really interesting to talk about. I've had my own experiences with things like that. But I'm just wondering, is there anything else you'd like to share? with people as kind of a message to kind of sum up um, about where we're headed. For example, you said that you're focusing on kind of collective trauma right now. You know, is, is it possible now that there's going to be suddenly a whole load of people that wake up that are going to need that type of help? Um, do you feel that the future's bright? And also uh, any links which I'll stick into the description at the bottom as well? Yeah, I think... Um the way I personally perceive collective trauma and things that are going on is that I always think that on a collective level, very much like at an individual level, for the most part, and this isn't 100% black and white, but for the most part, we're always biting off about as much as we can chew. So there's as much change in society and in our lives as we have, as we have the capacity to handle. So the more capacity and resilience that's on board, the more we'll be able to um, you know, handle change. So in, in that regard, do I believe there's a moment of like massive societal trauma that's that's sort of coming? Um, I would say that it's it's some of it's already there. It's it's been there for you know. All, think of all the wars and all the major atrocities that have gone on. Has all that stuff been processed? Has have all those physiologies moved through that? And and I would say no. And so then, how has that affected um, the gene expression of individuals that's passed on generationally? And then what would it take to, to shift that? Right. Um, you know, that's kind of where we get to a, a, you know, discussion of that. Um, but you know, I, I, as a general message, it's just, you know, don't lose the, the, the spirit of, of curiosity and fun and enjoying life, uh, regardless of how, um, much it can feel like, Hey, let's, you know, we got to make this change and all these things are happening. And, and, you know, we got to kind of push back on what's going on, whatever it might be. Um, I think it's, it's in those, emotions that um we are going to have our greatest abilities to create change um and to come up with ideas and to be innovative and inventive and to connect with people and um it's not to say that just feeling good is going to change the whole world but it's to say that that that's a foundational piece to how we develop things so um if we're losing sight of that and we're starting to feel unwell um i think it's a great service to find ways back to wellness um and and you know that's a I think a, a decent little ending message there. Great. And then what about links then to find you? Where would, where would people need to go? Yep. So you can check out collective hyphen evolution.com there. We have, you know, some of what's what, what, what we're kind of reframing collective evolution as for now. Um, and then our podcast is there and stuff like that. Uh, the pulse dot one that's dot O N E is a way for people to check in with what we're writing about. Um, I, from there you can find like my sub stack and stuff like that, just by clicking my name. Um, we're also on YouTube, Instagram, these sorts of things. And, uh, we have a membership, which we're, um, still sort of, uh, adjusting slightly, but, um, it's called the Explorer lounge. Uh, it's been around for quite a while and, uh, there's a decent little community there. Um, that's called, or that's at explorer lounge dot one. Uh, so you can check that out as well, but pretty much everything is, uh, is, is found on either collective evolution or the pulse. Thank you so much. And also, so this interview is going to be, you know, wherever anybody is watching or listening to this now, this interview is out there. But if people would like to listen to the discussion part, which we're about to dive into now for the next 30 minutes, then if you go to my Substack, which is robito.substack.com, and you can uh, you can check out the uh, the discussion part there. Um, so thank you so much, Joe, for doing this interview. It's been a pleasure. And I was racing through questions because I wanted to try and get from your awakening moment, if you like, to the present moment. And you've yeah. done a lot. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to have this discussion and go through the when you when you reflect on it, go through this process that um, 
has been kind of interesting over all these years to, to land where I'm at at the moment. It's always interesting to look back on it all. Thank you.